Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Physics 30 Atomic Physics Lesson 8, Particle Detectors and Accelerators. First, I want to talk about a Geiger counter. Now, Geiger or Geiger-Muller tube detects the ions which are formed by radiation entering a tube. Now, the tube is filled with argon gas and has a very thin piece of mica at the end which lets all types of radioactive radioactivity permeate through it. So, it basically looks like this. You have the window at the end. Now, notice the window only lets alpha or beta radiation in. Gamma radiate, oh sorry, oh, sorry, my apologies. Alpha and beta radiation can only enter through the micro window. The metal tube stops it, but of course gamma radiation can go through anything. So the radiation goes in, it hits an argon atom, and, well actually, let me explain. When an electron is knocked off an argon atom, a positive ion is formed. The ion is attracted to the negative inside of the tube. When the ion collides with the tube, it collects an electron and becomes an argon atom again. When the electron collides with a positive wire, a small signal is sent to the counter. Sorry. So, the ion goes down here, the electron goes up here, and we get that tick charge you see from uh, those uh, our Geiger counters or Geiger-Muller counters you see online or on TV. Anyway, now, that's how they work. Now, cloud chamber. In 1894, the Scottish physicist Charles Wilson was interested in the odd shadows that can sometimes be formed on cloud tops by mountain climbers, called Brocken spectrum. Look it up. It's interesting. Now, to be able to study this further, he came up with a way to build a device called the cloud chamber that would allow him to make his own mini cloud inside a glass chamber. He actually did this one weekend in his garage. It was about the size of a watch, the first one. Now, to be able to do this, he made this device so that he could he could keep the air inside super saturated with water. Now, air can usually only hold a certain amount of vapor, but super saturated means that the air was holding more vapor than would normally be able to at that pressure and temperature. It's a very delicate state that can be easily disturbed to cause condensation of the vapor into liquid drops. Now, you've seen this is something like what happens with the, the planes flying overhead. You'll see the condensation trails. Same sort of idea. Now, he quickly realized that as charged particles passed through his cloud chamber, they were able to ionize some of the molecules. This, is, this resulted in ions that caused water vapors to condense. Over the next few years, Wilson was able to see the path that charged particles had passed through by looking at the, for the little vapor trails formed in the chamber. Now, a bubble chamber is the exact opposite of a cloud chamber. Instead of a supersaturated vapor that can condense into a liquid, a bubble chamber uses a liquefied gas at such a low pressure it's on the edge of boiling back into a gas. As a particle passes through the liquid, it causes it to boil to a gas, leaving a trail of bubbles along its path. Now, a bubble chamber is otherwise quite similar to a cloud chamber. Cloud and bubble chambers are usually with a constant, within a constant magnetic field perpendicular to the path of the particles. This way we can observe the particles as they spin through a spiral pattern. So you've probably seen pictures like this, charged particles. Now, I want to stress both cloud and bubble chambers suffer from the drawback that they cannot detect neutral particles since only ions and ionizing photons can cause a, any change, charge, or change in the chambers. Okay? That's the big thing. They only detect charged particles. Now, the other thing is pair production. Usually when a neutral particle decays into a positive something, it spits out a negative something also. So charge is conserved. For example, this is a picture of a kaon, neutral kaon decaying into a positive and negative particles. Notice how the curved opposite directions, the radius looks to be about the same, indicating the mass and velocity is about the same. But the charge is different. Now, this is a typical cloud chamber uh, picture. We're looking at a uh, poop load of stuff going through here. Now, I want to draw your attention to a few things. Notice, most of the time, going straight through. Now, if you actually look closer, you see they're slightly curved because there is a magnetic field here. But those are interesting, but we, what we're much more interested in are these curls, these curving things. So what happens here, like here, something splits up into a positive and negative. We get a production of... A charged particle here and they're rotating and you can see we've got a bunch of these about the same size curlies or circles that suggests well that tells us 
charge particle of a certain mass, certain velocity is being created. So we're getting lots of these little ones about the same size. And we're getting a few bigger ones of the same size, which tells us another type of charge particle of a different mass or different velocity, but it's still a different radius. Okay, so this tells us a lot about um, the particles we're looking at. Now, so could, let's do an example question, actually. It's the easiest thing to do. So, apologies, sorry. Oh, I don't like that, never mind. Why am I doing that, never mind. Anyway, so, the image shown here was taken using a bubble chamber that was placed in a 4.35 times 10 to the minus 3 Tesla magnetic field out of the page. Notice that in the middle, we suddenly have two tracks appear that spiral in opposite directions. So right here, curves like this, and curves like this. It means there was a neutral particle came here that split. Anyway, uh, each of these tracks has an initial radius of 8.55 millimeters. We know that these particles are traveling at 0 0.0240 uh, times the speed of light. They came through a velocity selector. Now, excuse me. Explain what's happening in this image. Well, as I just said, we have a neutral particle coming in here, splitting into a positive and negative. Now, let me double check. Each of these, in this, sorry, a uh, bubble chamber that was placed in a magnetic field out of the page. So the magnetic field is coming out of the page. For the left-hand rule, this must be the negative particle. By the right-hand rule, this must be the positive particle here. Now, determine the charge to mass ratio of both particles. Crap, we got to do math work here. Okay. Now, here, go back. Our centripetal force magnetic. QVB equals, oh, sorry, MV squared over R is force centripetal. And well, the velocities cancel out. Now we're asked for the charge to mass ratio. So that's Q divided by M. That is V over BR. So we need the velocity, the magnetic field, and the radius. So Q over M. Now the velocity I said was 0 0.0240 C. Magnetic field, four seven five times ten to the minus three. Sorry, four point seven five times ten to the minus three Tesla, and the radius I wrote out was eight point five five millimeters. Five by thousand zero point zero zero eight five five meter. And what have we got? Grab Mr. Calculator, plug some numbers in. So getting 1.77 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. Okay? Now, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean anything to us because we don't use charge to mass ratios anymore since Coulomb, uh, sorry, since uh, Millikan's oil drop experiment allows us to calculate the charge on an electron, we can figure out Q. But I will point out the charge to mass ratio for an electron is 1.75 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. Really, really, really close. So what we're probably looking at here is an electron and a positron, or a positive electron, and this would be a negative particle. So what we're probably looking at is a high energy photon creating a positive and negative electron. Probably. I think it's neat. Anyway, moving on. Particle accelerators. Now, except particle accelerators can take a particle speed and speed it up to the almost. Ugh, I'll try this again. 
particle accelerators can take a particle and speed it up to near the speed of light, colliding with an atom and thereby discovering its internal parts. This is rather like how do you know what's inside a car by smashing together and seeing the bits that come off. Not the best way, but it's the only way we've got, well, really the only way we've got now to see uh, inside an atom or see what bits make up of an atom. Now, the W particle, which is involved in beta decay, can be produced and, pro and detected in high-energy electron anti-electron particles. Uh, uh, high-energy electron anti-electron or positron collisions, antimatter. Cyclotron. Now, a cyclotron, a particle accelerator that consists of two hollow metal shells shaped like D's in a perpendicular magnetic field. This is a particular type of accelerator. Um, the entire apparatus is placed in a vacuum. An alternating voltage is maintained across the D separation. The frequency of the alternating voltage is adjusted to increase the speed of the particles each time they move across the D separation. Now, it looks something like this. You get an ion source in the middle, proton beams, high-frequency power supply, and two Harkin huge magnets. Now, as I said, they speed up when they jump across this gap here. And you speed them up and speed them up and speed them up. This is how a cyclotron works. And, yeah, high-frequency power supply. Yes, so uh, you get a very high voltage across the plates so that... Um, against a high electric, a very strong electric field cause acceleration between the plates. But outside of the plates, you're in the uh, magnetic field of the large external magnets, so you just get twisted into a circle or turned into a circle. You only accelerate when you jump between the plates. Yeah, and this can get really, really fast. Now, why am I telling you this? Because you have to know it for a couple of homework questions or quiz question. Uh, and finally, the Large Hadron Collider. The LHC smashes groups of protons and large nuclei together close to the speed of light. 40 million times per second, it's seven times the energy of other accelerators. Now, this is a picture of inside it. Now, this uh, Large Hadron Collider is French Swiss border, impressively huge. I forget how many billions of dollars, 40-something billion dollars they spent on it, and it's not powerful enough. They, they're upgrading it now. Actually, by the time you watch this video, they might have finished the upgrade but they're cranking up the power even more. It's truly impressive. And if you look at this carefully, the idea of the scale, this is your scaffolding here. Yep, yeah. there's one place you walk on. Yeah, that's scaffolding. So this is designed to, to I want to say 40 kilometers long, to accelerate uh, atoms and ions to nearly the speed of light really, truly, impressively amount of energy here. Anyway, that's it for me. So go through this. Watch. The, if you're having any trouble, shoot me an email. Otherwise, I'll see you in class tomorrow. Work on your um, check your understanding questions, please. Have a good day.